Okay. Hi, John, and welcome to the first episode of this three-part mini-series. And I thought, perhaps given this is episode one, you could just give us a, a brief history of time and walk us back to really your your high school days before then we start to delve into some of the major topics today, which I want to talk about really two things, the reality versus the perception of working in finance, because I know the two can be somewhat um, a large difference in, in reality, and then your best and worst experiences of working in finance, because I think it's going to be a really good way for the listeners to get to know you as an individual while we embark down this three-part journey, but also I'm sure there'll be some invaluable advice as well for all the community. So perhaps a little bit about you and your background first, John. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Anthony. And, and thank you, everyone who's tuning in for the for the podcast. I always like talking to students, people who are at that formative period in their life when they're thinking about what they should study and, and what career they should go towards, because I think it's important to realize that a lot of the paths that you end up on are, are very different from the ones you might envision when you're in school. And, and that was certainly my case. I, I grew up in Louisiana in a town of 5,000 people. We had a bank, but it was not an investment bank. A bank was a place where you took a load of cash to keep it safe in your savings account. It was a place where you took a bunch of spare coins and traded them in for actual bills. You know, I knew nothing at all about banking as we know it in the city of London or Wall Street until I was probably about 25. Uh, that meant I went through my entire undergraduate program, which was in economics. I went through my first job, which was in public policy consulting. I went through the first year of my first master's degree in the States without any contact with the banking world and without really knowing anyone who had ever worked in banking. So then I went on to a 25 career, 25 year career at JP Morgan doing research, running research for foreign exchange, for commodities, for interest rates, and then for cross asset strategy. So the kind of stuff that was going through my head when I was the age of people on this podcast was vastly different from what I ended up doing, you know, with most of my life. When I was in high school, I think because I grew up in Louisiana, you know, the idea of being a professional meant you were a doctor or a lawyer. Those were kind of the role models, and that was kind of the direction I was heading in. And for, I guess, a good part of my undergraduate career, even though I was studying economics, the idea was that that was something that was just going to position me eventually to go to law school. And then from law school, I was probably going to work in some field of public policy in, in Washington, D.C., where I went to undergrad at, at Georgetown. I thought about working for the U.S. Trade Representative or the State Department or the World Bank or the IMF. These are the kind of things that were in kind of like my conception of a, a great job and a, and a great life. And it wasn't until I went to uh, graduate school the first time. I went to uh, the public policy school at, at Princeton, and I was studying economics within that track, that the Mexican peso crisis broke out in 1994. And, and that was the first time I realized that there was this nexus between economics and, and public policy and financial markets. And I thought, you know, I still want to go to DC and have a, a job working for the US trade rep or the White House or the State Department or whoever. But I wouldn't mind spending a couple of years learning about you know, finance properly, especially as it interacts and, and is kind of shaped by uh, by by economic policy decisions and, and policy mistakes. So I applied for a job or several jobs uh, on uh, on Wall Street. I got one with a money manager, UBS Asset Management, and I was a global fixed income strategist there for about a year and a half, covering all the bond markets outside the U.S., emerging markets and developing markets. It was a great job, but I was kind of the only one there doing that and everyone else in the shop was covering domestic US fixed income markets. So when I got a call from a former professor of mine at Princeton to join what was then known as Chase Investment Bank and be a, a currency strategist, I thought, this is great. You know, it, This is the middle of the Asian crisis. I'm going to join currency research. I'll work with someone who used to be my mentor and my professor at, at, at Princeton. So I'm, I'm going. And from there, uh, Chase ended up buying JP Morgan. I ended up at JP Morgan. I relocated to London. I had a variety of kind of senior jobs running research for various businesses. Uh, and that was essentially the, the fullness of my sell side career. I mean, the process of transitioning to the, to the buy side now after stopping at LSE and doing a degree in philosophy. But that's kind of the, the backstory. And the, the takeaway there is, you know, a lot of things are going to happen in your life and over your career. Uh, nothing is exactly kind of predetermined by what you're studying right now. You can kind of take everything incrementally one year or every couple of years at a, at a time. Mm. It's so, so interesting because talking to people like yourselves who've um, gone through the career up to this point, experienced, there's not many of them actually who had this really predetermined idea from youth and have just followed it all the way through. It's nearly always that there's been some 
opportunity, some life situation, something which has meant that they've they've ended up taking a slightly different route uh, in that sense. Yeah, the 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 term for that other people will use, which is kind of an uncharitable term, is is luck, meaning things will just happen to you that are way beyond your control. And the degree to which you know you're able to to capitalize that is a big determinant of whether or not you realize you know success or failure or kind of something in between. But there are a lot of things that you just can't control for. So you, you probably shouldn't beat yourself up too much that you haven't gotten on X or Y track by now yet. You know, that that opportunity just hasn't presented itself. You can only kind of control the things that are within your remit, what you study, how hard you work, how much you apply yourself in a certain situation. But the opportunities, you know, unfortunately can be quite random. Hmm. Well, look, I'm lucky because I've caught you where you're not at JP Morgan at the moment, even though you were there for near on 25 years. So the reason why I say that is because I think one of the hardest things for students to get access to, for one, is a kind of direct line, which which is why I love the podcast format. It's quite intimate, mm -hmm. a direct line to really hear from you. So like a super senior person. But then also, now that there's not so much constraint on you in terms of what you can and can't say, to get a bit of an right. insight really as to what is life actually like working at a major financial institution so this idea then of the reality versus right. the perception like what when i just say that phrase like what's your take and where do you want to start with that because i know it's a big question so when you say perception i think how do people form their perceptions they form their perceptions perhaps through contact with a handful of individuals they might encounter and if they don't encounter people who work in the city or wall street they formulate the perceptions based on things they see on television like the show industry or movies like wolf of wall street and i guess what i want to explain to people is what i think the common perceptions are of finance side of finance versus the reality and i'll break it down into kind of two subcomponents. one is what is the content of a job in finance, the reality versus the perception? And what's the, the culture of a, of a finance job, the reality versus the perception? And how much of that is negative and justified? How much of it is positive and not justified? And, and kind of where is kind of the truth value and, and all of that? And if I start first with kind of the, the, the content of a job in finance, I'm going to speak from the perspective of someone who's only ever worked in markets. So I did research, as I said, for 25 years, and I, I still do research. And research is one of kind of the three pillars of a markets business. A markets business in an investment bank has sales, it has trading, and it has research. The markets business is one part of an investment bank. The other part of the investment bank is the, the capital raising side through debt and equity markets and the, the lending side. And, and everything I'm describing on the investment bank side, the, the banking and the markets is known as the sell side. Its counterparty is the, the buy side, which is the investment management side encompassing hedge funds, asset managers, and, and asset owners. So everything I'm saying is about you know my research experience, but I think it's it's roughly representative of what goes on in markets. And I know a lot of your audience is is sort of aiming to be traders, um, and I think it's also reasonably representative of life on the the buy side, which is the complement to the the markets business in in investment banking. So if I think about what the the content of of those jobs is, I I, I believe the perception is that these are jobs that are intellectually demanding and and incredibly stimulating. I think people think of the content of the work as being incredibly dynamic, meaning the kinds of challenges you face today are not necessarily the challenges that you'll face tomorrow, even though it's all quite, quite stimulating. They think of the work as probably highly technical, very specialized, and very quantitative. And if we kind of stick with those features, I think those are pretty much bang on, meaning I think the perception of the work as being stimulating and, and demanding in a good way, kind of intellectually, was exactly my experience because I covered markets and I was an analyst, I had to make the call on what currencies, rates, commodities, you know, equities would do in response to how the economy was going to behave and, and what macroeconomic shocks would hit and, and what monetary and fiscal policy events would, would occur. And because each of those things I describe are quite unpredictable and unstable in themselves, the challenge every day was unique in a slightly different way. You know, it wasn't that day two was different from day one, 180 degrees, but there was also always some slight evolution of the macroeconomic environment that I would have to respond to as an analyst. And so if I have to think, you know, how many times was I bored in 24 years of doing investment research, I would say I could count them on less than two hands. I mean, not many times. And, and those times when I was bored, 
line up pretty nicely with lows in volatility in markets. You know, I was I was raised in a crisis environment in terms of my my market experience. I started during the Asian crisis. I like crises. I like financial crises. I like recessions as an as an analyst. Um, and so low vol periods were kind of boring for me. Thankfully, those didn't come you know very often. Um, but you know that's that's why I would always characterize that experience as being you know incredibly challenging and, and stimulating. In terms of the, the technical side of things, I know we're going to have a discussion in part three about people coming into finance from non-traditional backgrounds, and I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, if you're not somewhat comfortable with numbers, if you don't like doing some calculations, you should kind of question why you're looking at finance in the first place. You know, it doesn't mean you can't have a degree in philosophy or literature or psychology or something else and do very well in finance, but you have to kind of wonder, you know, if you really like that other stuff so much. Uh, do you like that plus numbers? You're fine. Do you like that stuff and hate numbers? Maybe you're not fine. Um, and the last part of it kind of has to do with specialization. I, I think one of the good and bad features of finance is that people are given roles that are quite narrowly circumscribed. You know, you're a salesperson covering this or, or selling this product. You're a trader who has this book. You're an analyst who covers the sector. And that's what you're supposed to do day in, day out. And to the extent that you do it 12 hours a day, five days a week for five years, 10 years, you get better and better at it and you're compensated for that expertise. But that can be quite narrow. That part of it, I think, is thankfully changing. I think because markets are more interconnected, uh, banks tend to look for people with a lot of these kind of crossover skills. I think there are certain parts of finance that are becoming quite dominant right now that are inherently kind of cross domain. If you think about data scientists who are very much in demand, those are basically statisticians who are also computer scientists. If you think about uh, climate investing, those are people who are kind of climate scientists, but also economists. So that that bit of it's changing. Um, the, the reality perception difference, I think, is a little more problematic on the cultural side, because if you ask people what their perception of the culture of the finance environment is, I, I think they're going to use words that are generally not flattering. You know, they're going to use words like aggressive, uh, competitive, uh, homogenous, meaning not diverse, and probably unethical. And you know, if I talk about two of those issues, diversity and, and ethics, these are ones that I think often are a turnoff in terms of the perception and how young people kind of feel like they will be welcome or comfortable in a finance environment. So to be honest about it, I think if you took a snapshot of the finance industry and you didn't sort of control for whether we were looking at the buy side or the sell side, or whether we were looking at the analyst associate population or the MD population, you'd say there's nothing about that demographic in aggregate, which is representative of the country, whether your country is America or your country is the UK. But if you get a little more granular and you kind of recognize there's been a little more of a, like a moral evolution in pe people's thinking about barriers to entry into finance and, and how the finance industry should welcome kind of a broader church, you know, for its own, you know, quality of the workforce. If, if you took a snapshot of the analyst associate population now, definitely at big investment banks, and I think at a number of sell uh, buy side firms that have formal recruitment programs, you would probably see that they're 50-50 men and women. And you'd probably see that the racial composition is also pretty representative of the underlying population of the of the country. So, you know, if you if you judge finance in aggregate, you'd probably say not very diverse. If you look at where it's come and particularly what it's doing around analyst associate populations, you'd see you'd say that's great. The ethical side of it, I think, is still very problematic for a lot of young people, um, and I believe that's partly because the ethical failings in finance are recurring. I think when the history is written on Silicon Valley Bank, there'll be a lot of malfeasance, which is unearthed and, and publicized. And you don't even have to write the history of Credit Suisse. I mean, the, the whole sad tale of Credit Suisse for the past 10 years has been, you know, con constructing this kind of monument to management malfeasance. Every year they paid a fine for the past decade and the, the value of those fines exceeded the market cap of the company at one point a month ago. It's just the kind of thing that makes you wonder if there's been any like learnings since Lehman and, and Bear Stearns. And, and this is a point where I would, you know, really push back on the perception that finance is somehow inherently unethical. I think because I'm older and because I have friends who have worked in other domains, I can tell you there's some pretty uh, unsavory stuff that goes on in fields like academia, which people think of as being you know, an example of, of, of virtue or, or an example of upstanding sort of individuals. 
there's an awful lot of malfeasance in law. Uh, it exists in medicine. It exists in technology. It exists in, in media. So I, I, I would be, in fact, I, I, I will never say that there are more kind of bad actors in finance than other sectors. I think there are bad actors in lots of places. What I will say is that the consequence of unethical behavior is much higher in finance than it is in other sectors because banks, many of them are systemically important. So someone that does the bad thing creates potentially more harm, more externalities for the rest of society than if that same bad person ran amok at running a, a toy shop or a cement factory or you know, the uh, department at a certain university. So it's, it's right to kind of hold finance people, I think, to higher standards than in other sectors because you know, there is a greater consequence to, to wrongdoing. But I think it's incorrect to say that finance you know, inherently attracts more of the bad actors than we see in other sectors. Yeah, no, I think it's a really timely piece to talk about that because given exactly as you just said, this latest banking episode that we've just gone through, for a lot of young people, I guess, it's the first one that they've seen, right? Um, right. Well, that they've been more interacting with financial press and news and consuming of that information. So yeah, I think it's going to be good for them to see that because if you didn't know any different, like you said, and you were looking at certain financial institutions, you, you might have some questions, but I think it's a very valid point thinking more broadly in, in other sectors, uh, mm -hmm. not too dissimilar in that way. But perhaps then to, to link into um, the next part then, talking about your best and worst experience. Um, so I'm quite interested to know about the worst. You definitely weren't bored then. We've, we've determined right. that it's uh, intellectually stimulating and, and I can totally... Um, you know, sympathize with that as well, given that I worked in kind of macro on a on a desk covering real time stuff. So that for sure. But perhaps then personally, what what were some of the things that really stick there as a memory out, out of your lengthy career of being uh, a memorable positive and one maybe that was a negative, but a learning lesson sure. all the same? So in terms of positives, like I said, like I, I came from kind of nothing in terms of my background. I was never supposed to be in banking. I was never supposed to be an MD. Like none of this stuff was ever kind of on, on in the scope of possibilities for me. So everything was kind of good and, and everything was gravy, whether it was the the compensation, the the professional opportunities I had, the promotions, the awards, whatever it was, it was, it was all so much more than I ever would have wanted. Um, so for me, like the ex experience that was more meaningful to me, and I only recognized this when I, uh, moved on from self-side research and I kind of wrote a final note to clients kind of summarizing my experiences and my learnings. The thing I most valued was the simple fact that I learned so much all the time. And, and this is because, you know, I'm, I've got kind of an academic disposition in some ways with some commercial leanings, obviously, but, but the point is I like figuring things out. And so the idea of getting paid to figure things out and talk to people about the things I figured out was a really, really great experience. And it's and it's why I'm still committed to finance, even after 25 years at one place and even after doing a philosophy degree. I still feel like if you're hardwired to like to solve problems and, and problems that are really at the intersection of economics and, and politics, like markets is still the place to be. And you just have to choose whether you want that market experience to be on the sell side or the, or, or the buy side. But conversely, you know, kind of linking that to worst experiences because I am an analyst and because the role of an analyst is, is a quite public role, meaning you, you write things, it goes out to tens of thousands of clients, you get on TV and you talk about it, you go to conferences and talk about it. Like it's really important to be correct and, and be correct for the right reasons. Um, because when you're incorrect, you feel like an idiot and you feel useless and there's a paper trail of it and there's a video record of it. And, and that for me was incredibly hard. And there were, you know, moments where I failed miserably publicly in terms of market calls. So when the EMU crisis first broke out, the sovereign debt crisis in the in the euro area, in December of 2009, I very publicly said, "Look, I think this is overblown, and I think this will be resolved relatively quickly in a few months." And then it went on to last for like two and a half years. So that was a very, you know, public failure. And what I learned from that is a few things. Number one is. You know, in finance, I think you're probably going to fail a lot more than in other domains, precisely because of the content of the role. I mean, you're you're trying to wrestle with something inherently unstable, which is the economy and policy and exogenous shocks, and how all that translates into markets. And if you think you're going to get that right 100% of the time, you're dead wrong. 
if you think you're going to get it right 75% of the time, you're dead wrong. I'd say if you're getting it right 60% of the time, that's really good. But that means 40% of the time, you're going to feel like an idiot. And if you're a researcher, you're going to feel like an idiot publicly 40% of the time. And, and so that's important to kind of understand, you know, the, the hurdle rate is really high to, to succeed. Um, but what I learned from that failure is that, you know, when you are getting it wrong, you need to be introspective enough and self-aware enough to, to self-diagnose and to figure out like, what did you miss? Did you, was your framework uh, inappropriate? Was your framework incomplete? Did you look at, you know, data that wasn't so relevant? Should you have focused on this instead? And, and what I learned is that, you know, I really needed to always understand where leverage was in an economy. Is it in household sector, corporate sector, banking sector, government sector? Is it in the investor base? And if it's in the investor base, what part of the investor base was? And that was a, a really important learning that I took to, you know, every subsequent business cycle and financial crisis. Like I made sure I knew where like all the bodies were buried so that when the shock hit, I could figure that that, that was going to be the hotspot. And, and I haven't always anticipated correctly all those shocks, but when they hit, I was pretty comfortable saying, look, this is going to be the problem and that's not going to be the problem. So, you know, the takeaway there is you're going to fail. You're going to fail a lot more than a lot of other things you could do in your life, but you got to teach yourself, you know, how to be better because you might not have someone tapping you on the shoulder and saying, this is what you did wrong. If you're lucky, you have that mentor or that manager to point the way, but a lot of times you just got to figure this out on your own. Mm. And is that something that say is something I've heard from many other people is about that importance of a role model, like a mentor that can help you navigate these peaks and troughs generally of a, of a career in that sense. Is that someone, did you have that someone that you said at the beginning, you had that uh, Princeton professor who yes. kind of called you over to chase. Is that a relationship that still exists? I'm sure it does. It is. In fact, she wrote, you know, my recommendation 25 years later to go to LSE and do my second master's degree. So that's a relationship that I still have. So I would distinguish between kind of formal mentors and informal mentors. Hmm. A formal mentor, I think, is someone who is designated for you by someone else or someone whom you choose. And it's recognized that you will have, you know, some degree of contact with them at, at with some regularity. And, and banks and many financial institutions have these formal programs, you know, specifically to kind of nurture talent and to retain good people. And that's all great if you have one of those people. Um, but that's not the only way to sort of get feedback on your work and, and, and to get guidance on your career. You can, you can have role models, which I guess role model is the better term rather than mentor, because you can identify people whose behaviors, who, whose work styles, whose uh, particular methods are, are very useful to you as a as a salesperson, as a trader, as a as a researcher, in terms of modeling and and kind of developing your own craft and your own expertise. So they don't have to know who you are. You never have to introduce themselves mm. yourself to them. But if they are visible, you can hopefully identify like what 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 traits they have, what uh, sort of ways of working or what frameworks they use analytically are are useful and transferable to you, and you can try to mimic those. And so I had, I guess semi-formal mentors, meaning my, my managers were always people who I felt very comfortable asking for guidance from, even though, you know, they were called manager, they weren't called mentor. And there were other people who, you know, aren't aware of it, but they always kind of set the standard for me analytically. And I, I, I sort of learned from them just by reading their stuff and, and listening to them. And, you know, those relationships are completely anonymous to them, but they were very useful to me. Yeah. My, my final question, kind of just going, linking back to the beginning, is about this reality and perception. You talked quite a lot about where you've come from, the type of town and environment. What do those people, like you must still have friends from home, from high school, maybe, what do they think of you now? And what's their perception of you? And how have you managed that? Because I know sometimes if you're going through this, this kind of social mobility process, almost, and you get to interact with lots of different people and members of mm -hmm. society. Like, has that been something you've been conscious of when you, particularly because you're, you're heading home, right, next week for... Okay, I, I, the reason I laugh is because, like, I'm from Louisiana. You can't stand on ceremony. You can't have airs in a place like that. So, <laughs> you know, you're, especially when some of these things just don't register as as experiences or professions in, in other places. Like, this isn't what mm -hmm. people do. And so if you... If I say I'm an investment strategist, you know that 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 isn't something that people can kind of connect with. So it's it's not kind of the basis for 
my interaction with people back home for the most part, because that that's just not the world of like the South. And, and I think that's an important lesson. Like the, the, the finance world is, is a particular ecosystem. And the more time you spend in finance working, the more time you will spend with finance people socially. And that's, you know, a sliver of society. And that's uh, a, a particular sliver of society where there's a big gap uh, in, in terms of relational equality with lots of other parts of society and parts of the country. And that's the case whether you live in the UK or the, or the US. So you, you need to, and this is difficult, you need to retain, you know, a, a, a sense of just self-awareness that you're mm. incredibly lucky to have gotten this opportunity that that of course you should work hard and 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 monetize it to the full extent you know you you deserve it but um that ecosystem is incredibly detached from from other parts of of society it will lead to all kinds of distance you know even within your friendship circle your family other kind of domains that are important to you and so you you really don't want to think of yourself outside of those circles as being nearly as important as you feel within that circle. Like that's a very kind of pernicious and I think kind of toxic mindset to have. Yeah. Well, look, that, that really leads us nicely into the next episode, which will air, which to give people a bit of a flavor, we're going to talk about setting goals and managing expectations for success and then company quality versus job quality and work life versus personal life. And then we'll also go on to have an episode where we talk a little bit about, you mentioned uh, non-traditional backgrounds and about how they could have their uh, interaction with finance in various different roles. Uh, the value of those newer credentials, talking a lot more about uh, quantitative finance and things of that nature. And then common attributes of successful analysts and associates. And you, know, you talked about kind of analyst associates and then the, the MDs. I'd be really interested to, to understand then with your looking back in hindsight, what have been some of the the memorable things or qualities characteristics that you've seen so they're all things we'll we'll dive into but Absolutely. remember to um follow and subscribe put on notifications to make sure you don't miss the next episodes with john two more still to come but john pleasure and thank you very much for joining me today Great. thank you for the invitation